Hollywood has been forced to take a hard look at itself as news of Harvey Weinstein's sexual misconduct spiraled into a scandal. Virtually overnight, women in Hollywood and elsewhere have gone on social media to share their stories of sexual harassment and abuse using the hashtag MeToo. This week, women in California politics joined the fray, saying enough. More than 140 women in state politics, from staffers to lobbyists to elected officials, have signed an open letter calling out what they say is the culture of sexual harassment and assault in the halls of state government. To discuss this further, I'm joined by Sacramento lobbyist Pamela Lopez, who helped organize the letter campaign, California State Senator Nancy Skinner of Berkeley, and KQED politics and government reporter Marisa Lagos, who joins us from Sacramento. Welcome to you all. And Pamela, let me begin with you. Why did you and other women who work in the state capital community decide to issue this open letter? Because we've had enough. In the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal, I and several other friends started comparing notes and talking about our experiences working in California politics and the California political community and started sharing some uh, very upsetting stories about quid pro quo sexual harassment that we've faced from powerful men in the capital community, not only legislators, but other powerful lobbyists, other appointed officials. Uh, and, and even- you have a story that happened to you. I Can you do. tell us about that? Even stories that border on sexual assault. I was walking into a public restroom, thought I was alone, uh, opened the door to walk into the restroom, felt a body rush up behind me, slam and lock the door, and I spun around, and by the time I had turned around, I was face to face with a, a sitting legislator who had uh, unzipped his pants and exposed himself and was masturbating. Um, I backed up across the room and he told me several times um, in explicit terms to touch his genitals while he was masturbating. And I remember thinking, oh my God, what do I do? Don't, don't, make, a, don't make a scene, but be very clear that I don't want to be here. And so I said over and over again, no, I will not touch you. No, I will not touch you. But did you speak out after that? Did you report him? No, I didn't because I was afraid of not only formal, but informal repercussions that I might face to my career. Um, we have laws in place that are intended to protect women in the workplace, and we certainly have laws in the uh, legislature to protect uh, legislative staff, um, but it's much more difficult to address all of the informal consequences that a woman faces if she speaks out against her perpetrator. Everything from other lawmakers refusing to take your meetings, other lobbyists uh, who have a tendency to protect the bad guys looking at you funny. Um, it's overwhelming to be involved in a scandal and our culture, not only in California politics, but in the nation as a whole, um, still blames women. And so I kept my mouth shut mm -hmm. out of, out of uh, fear for my career. Senator Nancy Skinner, you also signed this, le this letter. Why did you decide to do that? Well, similar, enough is enough. And we know that this is pervasive. There's the hashtag Me Too. I think the hashtag should be Who Not? Mm -hmm. Because women experience this, not only in state capitals, workplaces, campuses, mm -hmm. everywhere, everywhere. Whether you're a student, you're an employee, as is expressed here, the lobbyist. And the real, what we see is that we have some decent laws, but the consequences to the perpetrator are not enough. They haven't served as a deterrent. And until the, the perpetrator, and in many cases it's a man, but not always, but until the perpetrator really experiences a consequence that's a loss of status or some legal consequence other than just a payout that's confidential, we're not gonna see this change. And Marissa, I want to bring you in at this point because is there a culture of complicity here at the Capitol, a culture of protecting the institution over the individuals? I think there is. I mean, I think that we see this again in Hollywood, in Sacramento, um, in, in really workplaces across the nation. But I think that there is, uh, in some ways, even more so in the capital, uh, a different a, a different culture. There's the protectionism of wanting to protect the legislature. There's the fact that there's so much turnover. And then there's this fact that you have situations that arise um, that really sort of skew the lines between what's work and what's not work. A yes. lot of uh, political events happen in bars and restaurants with alcohol. They are raising money. They are having meetings. Um, you know, and I so, so I think that sometimes that that culture kind of 
uh, seeps into this broader problem. But I do think that, you know, as we saw in Hollywood, this is not a secret. This is an open secret in a lot of ways. Maybe we don't, we haven't connected all the dots, but I think that in the past, the legislature itself has been um, very wary to tackle these issues, to maybe hold itself to the same standard as it wants to hold other state and private businesses and agencies, um, and really, you know, to protect it because that is what has always been done. And I guess the other layer um, that makes this even more troubling, right, is that a lot of this is taxpayer funded. You have lawmakers who are paid for by the taxpayers. A lot of these settlements um, for accusers are funded through taxpayer money. And so, Nancy, I have to ask you about this. I mean, the legislature has a history of harassment complaints. You were recently named in connection with one of the complaints, this case involving a former legislative director, Nancy Finnegan, who received $100,000 from the Assembly to settle her claim of harassment and discrimination against her boss, former Assemblyman Steve Fox of Palmdale. Now, she says that she complained to you because you were the rules you chair were, at the time, and we have a process. You were chair of the Assembly Rules Committee right. at the time, and you did nothing. So here's, we, I certainly am never going to impugn any woman. And it is very, not only possible, probably real, that women in the Capitol feel intimidated to complain about a sexual harassment circumstance because of fear of retribution. However, and again, I, everything of her story I'm not going to question, but in, as the rules chair, the complaint that she filed, and I was chair in 2013 and not past that time, but in 2013 the complaint she filed was not a sexual harassment complaint and it was not against Mr. Fox. It was against her own woman chief of staff. Now, that's not to say that she didn't have the experience she did, but it's just that in what was presented to me and it was in her writing, it was not a sexual harassment claim, complaint. But let's go back, let's leave that alone because I don't want to, what well, I, I want to talk about is why, wh what caused this tipping point? Mm -hmm. So we've had many tipping points in the past. Anita Hill was certainly a tipping point. But then many women became silent because Clarence Thomas became the Supreme Court mm -hmm. Justice. So there was no, it was like she wasn't believed and what's the point of talking about it if we're only gonna be ourselves, the women impugned. Mm -hmm. But I think right now there was another tipping point that we haven't talked about as much, which is that the sitting president Yes. Was He talked about groping women. We heard it, and yet he was elected, and he beat a woman. So I think for many of us, while we may have turned our, you know, turned our cheek at times or just figured, okay, we live with this, it's reality, I think we're finally at like, no, no, we don't want it to be reality anymore. And silence perpetuates it, and we all have to unite, and we all have to change the circumstances. That's so right. coming back to the state capitol then, um, what kinds of reforms would you and other women who signed this letter like to see? There are several things that we like to see, and, and part of the reform effort may be related to changing some laws or may be related to changing some policies and rules committee or the way that the legislature works with staff. But we're talking about a professional community here. So first of all, not everybody is an employee of the legislature. I'm a lobbyist. I work right. in the Capitol, right. but I, as the yeah. senator was saying, uh, I do not work at the Capitol. Um, and our intent also is not to um, uh, create a lightning rod by focusing on any particular case or any particular ca payout or identifying right. any particular perpetrator. We are talking about a culture that systematically devalues women and blames women for experiencing discrimination or quid pro quo sexual harassment um, or assault in the workplace. And so there are also informal changes that we are right. looking for. And first and foremost, it's, it's this kind of change. It's having this conversation. Right. Right. It's signing on to a letter where, where we all support each other. It's telling women that um, I believe you. I believe yeah. your story. I will have your back. I will stand up for you. I will have a cup of coffee with you in a public place when everyone else is whispering about you behind your back and trying to make you feel bad about standing up and standing out. I will be there to support you. But, but may I play devil's advocate here because some might say if you don't name the accusers, aren't you also then part of the problem because you're providing that veil of secrecy that men have been able to hide behind and therefore perpetuate this kind of behavior, Senator? These, these are very tricky because look, women named Trump. Mm -hmm. Women named our former governor Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. He became governor. Anita Hill named Clarence Thomas. 
he became the Supreme Court justice and still is. So that to me doesn't say, all right, women, just be quiet. It rather that we have to, what are the conditions that we have created and set up in our institutional structures that lead to this? And until we change that, naming names alone is not enough. We've already seen that. Naming names alone is not enough. So I think that all of us in joining in on this are what we are committed to is changing those structural circumstances and conditions so that when the woman names the name and a proper investigation happens, and you, you have to protect the accuser and the accused, that due process must happen. Yeah. But that once that naming is named and there is the real documentation, that action is taken and there's consequences. Marisa Lagos and exactly. the woman is protected. There's no That's right. no negative consequence right. to That's her right. for reporting and naming the name. I was a Marisa little girl during the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas mm. scandal and that's one of my earliest political memories. She was a, a, an idol of mine, an Ivy League educated attorney and I watched her at I was I was 10 years old I think at the time yeah. get drugged through the mud. So before we name names, we want to know about how we're going to protect women who step forward. Let let me bring Marisa Lagos, who's in Sacramento, into this conversation. Um, so we're talking about reform, structural changes in place. Right. Marisa, the, the number of women lawmakers in the state legislature is at its lowest level in more than two decades. 22%. 22%, right? And um, so do you expect any kind of real changes will happen here? You know, I agree with the senator in the sense that I do think a tipping point is happening. And I think it did start last year during the presidential election. Um, I know that when that when that tape came out, I myself had a sort of realization that, you know, I had been groped in college. I hadn't even really considered that sexual assault. And mm -hmm. I think that putting a name on this and talking about it is really powerful. Um, in my industry, in, in journalism, this is an issue. We have sort of the same problem lobbyists do, right? We work in and around this, um, but we are not part of the same structure. And so you can't go to HR if a lawmaker right. hits on you, as has happened with, to me multiple times, or calls you late at night and asks you to come over. Um, what you can do, I think, is speak out and try to change those really minor interactions and call them out in the moment, because I think our everyday stuff is really what leads to the bigger problems. If we can change the way we handle things um, and call people out when it happens in the moment, when it's just calling somebody honey or commenting on what they're wearing, yeah. that could actually lead to some big changes. Yeah, so this may be that tipping point for a culture of accountability. And I want to thank you all for being here. Pamela Lopez, thank you. Senator Nancy Skinner, and also Marisa Lagos. Thank you all.